Martin of Fire, welcome to the show. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Just quickly, actually, I, I did realise that a fire is not actually how you pronounce your surname. And I've just said it and I realised it. <laughs> that's not how you pronounce it, is it? No, uh, my, my name is Ossia. But um, yeah, Charis Ossia doesn't have that kind no. of ring. To it. <laughs> no. And, no. you know, this is something that has uh, followed me through all my career. And it's been just a, another talking point. Um, I've even ended up in the Wolves Pack. Uh, um, uh, you know, the pub on, on the soap opera Emmerdale uh, discussing this. I've been on the, the bed and the big breakfast. It's something that's followed me around. But um, yeah, I just think when I um, started playing rugby league um, and this whole Charity Fire thing came about, um, um, uh, Colin Welland, who wrote the, uh, the screenplay to the movie Charity of Fire, was at Twickenham that famous day back in 1987 when I was playing in the Middlesex Sevens and that was the first time that Swing Low Sweet Chariot was ever sung and I remember meeting Colin in Australia on a Great Britain uh, Lions Rugby League tour and he said to me, yeah, I was there that day and we all started calling you Chariots and I remember it and started, uh, you know, taking off in, in articles and, uh, you know, on TV. Everyone just died calling me the fire. And uh, I used to uh, push back to it, but then sometimes in life, you know, uh, you just have to go with things and I've got some mileage out of it. Yeah, wow. So first up, I wanted to ask you, do you, in your opinion, young people of today, do you believe that they're less resilient? That's a great question and I could approach it different ways um in this modern world is there less resilience needed to uh, have a happy life then you'd have to say yes <laughs> because in uh, my day i remember <laughs> we didn't have the internet we didn't have iphones we had uh, encyclopedia botanicus you have to go and search out the things so you needed more resilient to survive, but innately is there less resilience in children? No, um, I wouldn't agree with that. But yeah, I'd say you don't need as much resilience, but then if you're going to stand out and be that guy, then you'll need resilience. So you just have to go and find it. I remember having a, a talk with um, Liam Williams and a, uh, the Welsh uh, winger a couple of years ago when Sean Edwards asked me to go uh, and spend a bit of time in, in camp with the Welsh uh, squad before the Six Nations. And, you know, I had to talk with, you know, all the outside backs and just about my love for try scoring and what, where that came from. And, um, you know, I, I just spoke to them and uh, took some, a little bit of a bit about my story. And I said to them that, you know, you've got everything here. You've got, weights you've got um ice uh bars you've got um you know all these chambers and everything but i said everyone's got that so what's the difference maker you know i also remember talking to phil the, the late great phil bennett and he said that you know just like me it, he went to an athletics track and trained with actual sprinters not with rugby players get his speed so that was our difference maker you know and everyone knows to be different you've got to be doing something different to what everyone else around is doing mm -hmm. and as we get more then we have to be more creative about how we become different and, and that difference maker and so you have to uh you know just go out and find ways to be uh, uh resilient it was easy when i was at border sport because um the hot water wasn't working a lot of the time so i had to have cold showers now we have Eventually, and, and the water warm all the time. So I engineer things. So when my kids have, you know, this might sound a bit cruel. Um, if they uh, do something wrong, I will say to get your game back, you owe me a minute and a half cold shower. And I know for them to do that, it's going to take some, you know, um, uh, resilience. It's going to take something. But they want the reward. They want to play their game, or they'll want the fifty pounds. They uh, want to get, you know, if they do the cold shower. So it's just, you know, um, engineering stuff into their life. But just things where you get uncomfortable. And they say, even if there's no intrinsic benefit from it, it's almost that placebo effect. And you, know, you, you just, you just, 
just just the, the, the mental aspect of it. You're doing something which you don't want to do. You're doing something that most people will not do in their life. Most people on this planet will not sit in a cold shower for three minutes. And I did it this morning. I know when I woke up at this morning, for me to go through that, it took something. And I know the rest of my day is on gravy, talking to you. You know, when I go out and talk now, if I have to go and do a talk to 100 people, which sometimes used to put the fear of God into me, I think to myself, what would I rather do? I'd rather do that than sit in a cold shower for uh, three minutes. It's all about the mind, isn't it? Your perception is your reality. And you can play tricks with your mind and then try and control it and your emotions as well and understanding that. Um, my dad uh, wrote a book, which I've just had published by Chipmunk Publishing recently, uh, called Understanding Your Emotions. And I didn't really read that book, if I'm honest, through my career, but it's something I read, um, you know, maybe three or four, five years ago or something. And then it's amazing how reading that book and I thought to myself, oh, that's why I am why I am. It's obviously because my dad had programmed to me early, telling me things which have stuck with me. Simple things like, you know, uh, Tell me your friends, and uh, you know, and I'll and I'll and I'll show you who you are. Basically, people, you know, there's all these technical terms out of it. You obviously know five most people that you surround right. yourself with and all that. But it's just basically simple. You know, if your friends are all successful, chances are you're successful. If your friends are bank robbers, chances are well, you're a bank robber. You know, and, and things like that. These are just common things that we know. So just try and find and seek out the people and stay connected with them that you want to be associated with. These are people like Sean Edwards, people like Kieran Bracken, and uh, people like Chris Basper. You know, all these people, uh, and I, I, you know, get knowledge from I, I text them. I get texts on them. I keep them updated on, on Tyler's progress. You know, obviously, uh, Aaron Farrell, one of the greatest, um, you know, rugby players to play for England. I knew Owen as a child. I saw the things that he did, and they resonated with me. I knew that one day I would probably have a kid. You know, I, I know Sean, as I say, I know Jason Robinson. And so a lot of what I've learned from them and, you know, some of the things that I've uh, done myself and my own experiences and things that I've uh, done to become successful. And that's why I say the most important thing that you can have in your life is your story. How you got to where you are, where whether that story is, you know, um, one of triumph or one of uh, not triumph. It's still hold on to it because it, that is valuable. And that's what we see that men do, is it? Whether they, you know, they end up in prison doing life and then they come out, they share that story with people to educate the youth. And the same way, whether, you know, you end up with MBE statues and you become a millionaire, that's still a story that, you, you know, is marketable and you can package that up and then sell that to people and if it resonates with them, they're going to take it on and they're going to, that's going to have some benefit to the world. So your story is so, and the more powerful and engaged in the story, the better, isn't it? Because if your story is just, oh, I was born into a rich family, I went to a great school, uh, my dad gave me everything, I didn't really have to struggle very much, and I became successful, the end. That's not going to sell, is it? <laughs> well, if yeah. you're France in Ghana, and you, you know, have to go on boats and you're a refugee and all that, that's going to resonate with people more. And it has to, that story has to grip people and has to affect them emotionally. And what better way to, you know, it's just like movies, what movie affects you? And that's what I, um, that's what I say the other day. Please stop me because I do ramble on a lot and I get so no, emotional. I, the, I can feel it. I can feel it when I'm speaking. There's so, <laughs> there's so much gold there. So I actually want to come back to, that what you were talking about your son so for for people listening uh, martin's son tyler just signed his profession first professional contract and that is a, an achievement in itself and there's a journey that will go on and the reason i talk about resilience is that you mentioned there about engineering adversity now i speak to i get parents message me i get parents reaching out with my work being based around building mental strength in people that i get parents asking how do i build this in my child how do I my, my child has got low self-confidence low self-esteem they they struggle with setbacks they fear failure quite a lot and what do I do how do I how do I get there 
And it's really interesting that you said that your level of resilience is sort of really dependent on the challenges that you face in life. We have less challenges right now in the sense that if I want to order a pizza right now, it'd be here in about 10 minutes. It's going to be at my door. If I want to order something like outrage, like anything, it can get it off Amazon. It'll be here within within a day, sometimes less than a day. So the the resistance that we face is far less. I would say that there are different resistances for young people in the world. Like, for example, it's way harder for a young person to get on the property ladder right now. Financially, it's never been harder for a young person. There are stresses and adversities there. However, the lack of resistance that we face in other areas of our lives is not really setting many of them up for the other resistances, the other adversities that they may face in a different sphere in their life. So a different element. And you would know better than, than anyone that you can transfer a lot of your lessons from sport into other aspects of your life, right? So leading with that, going back to your son, Tyler, and you talking about engineering adversity, have you done that because you knew that the world is a little bit easier? You know that there are some things that come just that little bit more simpler. You've also had success yourself. You've set up an environment. You said he's going to a private school. So I'm a real big believer in that there has to be some form of adversity, but some people are not willing to place it in front of their child through thinking that it's either cruel or they're worried that they may not succeed against it and they they want their child to succeed. They want them to be safe. So how do you blend that engineering adversity and creating support and safety for your kids? God, there's a lot in there. <laughs> totally, <laughs> Where- yeah. Where, where, where do I start? Um, you know, adversity is part of life, so it's common, isn't it? Um, so it's like, in where we say, in school, you learn, and then you are tested. You, you learn, you go through your course, at the end of the year, you, um, uh, you do your exam. In life, it's the flip, isn't it? You're tested, then you learn. So the thing is, if you can engineer adversity before, you're preparing for, because you know it's coming. The rain is coming. You know, one day I will walk, I don't know what day it is, and I always see it now when I see, because, you know, like, because I, I, I've got a bit of a, a funny mind. I don't know, it always, always um, um, when I go to games and I, you know, they have a minute silence for, um, for a, you know, a long lost soul, you know, a great player, whether that's, um, you know, uh, JPR has just passed away or Bill better or whatever. I always think to myself, God, one day that's going to be me. <laughs> so with that mindset, you know, so you know, so the end is coming. So if you know the end is coming, but before the end, you know that some form of adversity is coming. So you prepare for it. I know that my son, he, his first bit of adversity came where he's a June baby. So if anyone knows, you know, in the school years, if you're the boys are born in September, tend to do well because if you're born in June, then you're almost a year younger. Then you know, it's almost like you're playing a year up in your own year. So mm-hmm. Tyler was good from you know the year from the age of two to about ele- to about eleven. We used to have names like Tyler; it was fantastic. You know, if you see all the pictures, he was a bigger boy. Then went through puberty. He was he was a, he, that was his first bit of adversity that he had to. To find things weren't going so well for him. He was crying. I mean, was, I always remember him, or remind him of that now when things are going well. He just imagine that he's just got into the signed professional form, he'd contract. He uh, just got himself into the England squad. So he's in England on just an 18 training squad as well. I said, remember the times when, remember that time when you were 13, going through all those growing, growing pains. You know, you came fourth in your 100 meters sprint school. You just couldn't. Things are going so wrong. Well, that's the time when people give up, don't they? Because when you set a goal in your life, one of three things happen yeah, when you set that goal. And apparently, I don't know where I heard this stat from, but I heard the stat that only 3% of people that, you know, achieve, you know, only 3% of the people that go after things achieve them. Because at that time, when you were 13, that was the time when most people give up, don't they? When you're going for it, you, you, you don't think you're going to achieve it. And, it, you know, things are going wrong. You can't understand it. Even me, I had the moment where I thought to myself, God, I remember going to watch a game. And I think he was crying after and I actually for a moment. 
nearly sort of left and went, God, this game has got no chance. I was actually going through my... So even then I had to catch myself at that moment and go, no, you believe in it, so go on it. Go on, keep going on this journey. And I had to remind myself, it's not the achievement. Because some people, you know, it's the fear of failure that gives you know, that makes you give up as well. You think, I'm not going to achieve it, so that's why you give up as well. But I, I had to catch myself in that moment and go, it's not about the actual, it's about going on the journey, and that is the joy. I've achieved everything that I could achieve in rugby. My career's over now, and now is not the most enjoyable. It's not, you know, I'll go out today, and if I walk around, and this is in London, the rugby league is not a big sport in London, but I know that if I walk around, long enough, someone's going to come up to me and go, you might the fire, just randomly, probably because of the reality TV shows I've been on as well as as the as the, as, as the rugby. But it's, it, that's not the joy, even though, you know, it does make me feel, oh, well, you've done something well. Whatever. I think to myself, that's not the joy. The joy is trying to achieve what you achieve. That is the essence of the pure joy, going on that journey and getting a little better. It's like, what's the essence of life? It's living. It's not getting to the end and thinking, Oh, I've got all this money. I had a great life. The end. No, it's the going through it, the ups, the downs, the this, the little bits of success, getting the, signing the contract, scoring the try, doing the bit. So, why would it be the end of your life? If your end of your life is not the enjoyable bit, why would it be the end of your goal of achieving it? Of you know, no. you know, Owen Farrell was the greatest, you know, ten to play for England. So, but surely it, it's the it's the journey, it's the bits, you know, it's the highs, the lows, the things. And that's why you've got to remember and understand that it is the journey. And so it's trying to get that mindset. So my thing for parents is to remember your story, what you've achieved, you know, whether that's be passing your driving test, getting the job, doing all the things which you take for granted. No, they're incredible achievements. You know what I mean? So as I said, the thing is remembering your story as a parent and trying to get your kid to remember their story, all the things that they have achieved. It's getting into that the academy is getting into the team at school striving to get from the b team to the a team from the c team to the b team and, and all those successes going yes what's next yes what's next? they keep going on that journey and, the, and the, uh, you know i'm not preaching um uh anything new and that's the thing is you know <laughs> knowledge is ancient but it all the only thing is you're trying to do is connect with people that's the only new thing because um uh, just a, a dumb little story that uh uh, Chris Ashton, who I'd never met through his whole rugby career, right? But I met him, I think, last year uh, at an England game. And imagine that, two people who've had great careers, both retired, and I always have that moment sometime where two, it's always, you know, you, that moment when two famous people who have never met each other but know about each other's career meet, and you both have that smile on your, your face. That's a, 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 an experience I've had lots of times, and each time I have that experience, that's one of the joys of life. Especially if it's somebody who you admired when you were young, like the day I met George Best, or the day I met so many different people, you know, or I met the, you know the Fab Three and JPR, Phil Bennett and Gareth Edwards, and I'm and I'm talking to them, and they're, they're telling me about tribe I was for. Like those are the moments that you get in life, which are so great. So it is about your journey and about remembering all the things that you've overcome, but then you just. Because you've overcome them, you trivialize them and put them back. Now go and understand and take um, take a great um, joy from them and understand that you, if you keep working, you are going to get better. I don't know how great you're going to get, but if you set the feeling high, then, you know what I mean, if you hit not not quite as high, you're still the best that you can be. And I always say, if you are in the right place, that you're doing, you're loving things that love you, and you try and be the best that you can be. Chances are, you're going to be pretty great. Yeah. So you, but you have to believe that. You know, it's like beliefs are skills, skills are beliefs. Yeah. You have to actually believe it. Because I say, if you're running a marathon and you don't believe you're going to get to the end, you can't. But you want to give up. Right? So I'm just saying, if you set a goal, believe it, achieve it, you'll die. We will give up. Those, nothing else can happen. Once you understand that concept, you just go for it. Hopefully, yeah, but don't you? And that's what you do. You and enjoy it, and you just go go on that journey. I can't exactly, say any uh, exactly what you're exactly what you're saying there around the story. And I like what you're talking about with your sons. How you're relating to what does this mean about you? 
So going back to an old adversity that they had or a, an old moment where they had to lean upon their character to actually get themselves through it. And I think right. that's where some people miss out. They That's a, a, a really important link that I think I see many people miss out on because, again, parents get caught up in the outcome. So my yes. son, daughter getting into this and if they're not doing that and they've, oh, no, they failed. Oh, they haven't achieved it. Oh, oh well, yeah. what's going on? I didn't make the squad. I didn't get the contract. Some, or or sometimes even worse in their eyes, Joe Bloggs went off and got it before yeah. me. That's and tough. and, That's and tough. now what do we do? Uh, but what you're talking about is reminding them of the character that it's either creating and one that they perhaps were in the past. And I think that yeah. is so important. I think that is super important for, for leaning on that. Yeah, don't get me wrong, but in life, you aren't going to be judged on the outcome, so you can't lose sight of that. But you're not getting a consistent outcome over time without good process. So you know that. Just getting back to my um, procession story, because as I said, you, I go off on tangents, and sometimes I lose my train of thought. And this is the reason why I think I had a fear of public speaking, because I knew that within my brain, I go off on these tangents, and I, I, I had to be coming back, and I think it happens to once, and then you're just stood there in front of all these people, and then that fear, I think that maybe a lot of people where that fear comes from, it it comes from lo losing your, your your train of thought. But just going back to that Chris Ashton story, we, I walk into the room with Chris Ashton, we don't know each other. And then he just said to me, I know, I know, Martin, because a lot of the people I've seen, people talk about Chris Ashton and they you know and my name. And I remember, I think um, Austin Healy was saying, Chris Ashton, the greatest try scorer of either coach because he's the, the, the highest premiership try scorer. The greatest try scorer we've seen in either coach since Mine of Fire. And I know that he's from Wigan. And I know that he would have watched me when he was young. And, I, and I've seen the way he played. And I put two and two together. And I understand because life is about understanding path, isn't it? <laughs> and I know without anyone telling me that he's watched me and he's learned what I've learned from Thor Edwards, what I learned from Ellery Hanley. And he's put his own spin on it. And he's come up with something and he's gone in the package. And I knew all that. And I'd never met the guy. And as soon as he walked into a room, he said, I, he knows, I said, can you do a video for my son Tyler? Because I know that I don't tell my son things, but I'm just Tyler's dad. But then he hears Chris Aston saying something, it's different. And I said, that's the beauty of life. It's about connecting with people. It's not about the knowledge. It's about I could, a parent can tell his kid something a million times and he ain't going to listen. But then if Michael Jordan or whoever... He, he admires comes and tells him the same thing. That's why we get people to come to court. That's why I said, um, that's why in life I always used to say that, um, you know, you cannot connect to everybody. But everybody can connect with somebody. So you just need enough somebody, and that's how you connect with everybody. And I think I remember understanding that when I, I don't know if you know about the 100 monkey um, test that they did, I think in yes, Japan. Yes, so the ladders, the, with the ladders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. And they beat the, the monkeys, beat each other, and then by the end of it, the yeah. the monkeys don't actually realise why they're beating each other up. Yeah, but that's just the way they're saying that energy and everything grows. Isn't it? That's a positivity and love. So if there's enough people love loving in the world, then the world gets better. If the, the enough people hate in the world, then the world gets a uh, you know a, a worse place. And I just why that's why love always triumphs in the end. That's why you share things, you you help pe enough people. You know, you pay it forward. You have that mindset because I know that once upon a time, we, we know there was a guy. That's why I'll always give a, you know, I don't care who it is. If I see someone at training with my son and, and you know, and he looks like he's on his phone or whatever, I always pull over and go, mate, do you need a lift? You know, because I know, because I remember him back to my days and I was at Wolverson Hall and I remember this, there was this um, a guy who used to give me a lift to training at um, Ipswich, the rugby club. And I, and I always just think to myself, God, you know, he didn't have to do it. I knew why he did it, because I was a good rugby player. And if someone sees something in you, then they're going to help you. That's the way that life is. But, you know, you should do that whether there is, you see that or not. So it's always finding that opportunity, even if it's something, you know, little. Like, you know, I could get, if I see someone on the street, you know, give, give them 50p or, or give them something. Like, even if people say, oh, well, you know, they're, you know, they're, it's a big crimes, you know, they're, they're criminals, they're doing this. I think, no, if that person is on the street and he needs 50p, whether he's, it is a business or whatever, you know, you can make a decision, you can 
you're good, you know. I mean, just share that rather than share negativity and just having that. And it's all comes on your mindset, how you see the world, how you see your place in the world, how you see that we are all blessed that we've got so much to be grateful for. And it all boils down to how you see the world, isn't it? Do you see it glass half full or glass half empty? You know, I mean, whatever you, hmm. wherever you are in this world, okay, there's going to be people on top of you, but there's going to be people below you. And even if you think you're the top, people are going to still put you down. But the way that life is, but how do you want to view it? And I always try to view the world as, you know, glass half full. And that's, you know, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be born in this time. And people used to say, oh, how did you handle racism? How do you handle, it must have been terrible for you to be born in the 80s and, you know, and to be, and when I see now people talk about racism and this, I said, no. I'm blessed. Ever since I saw a, uh, a series back in the 70s called Roots, I, I think it's like, Jesus, people used to treat human beings that way. You know, when they talk about slavery, I'm thinking, man, I'm glad I was born in 1965 and not in 1865 or 1765. I'm glad that I was born in this country. I could have been born in the developing world. And, you know, and my journey would, would have been something similar to France and Ghana or wherever to get to that. So it's just, how you view things and try to get, you know, it's easy to make my my, my kids feel grateful. Or I sometimes you think that, but sometimes they, they don't think that. Even now, they've got all this, you know, all the benefits and all the positives, and they've got me and my dad, which sometimes they don't see as an advantage. But I, I have to say to Tyler sometimes, Tyler, you do realize if you achieve 50% of what I've achieved, but you achieve that in this modern world, You'll probably be ten times richer than I am, and people will view you probably so much better than I am. I said, so you know, it is. It is. You you should feel grateful that you you have me. But but I didn't have. Uh, don't get me wrong. I didn't have um, a uh, father who was into sport. I had a father who wrote a book called Understanding Your Emotions. I got to understand about you know triggers and how you feel things and. You know, you know, as a thing, as a, as a positive. So now when you feel an emotion, you know, frustration or you feel anger, you feel joy, you feel anything. You think, oh God, I'm just, oh, that, that's amazing. Because, you know, the worst you can do is feel nothing because then you've got, then you've got nothing. And you do, you know, you do nothing. What people do, they're playing PlayStation or they're watching something. They're just like in, in that zone, isn't it? But if you're feeling immense anger or you're feeling immense frustration, you can, you can harness that and think, oh God, I'm learning something about myself, how I feel in these times. So when next time I feel that in an important situation, because that's what experiences, when they talk about experienced sportsmen, you know, like, oh yeah, he's got great experience. All that means, he's felt the emotion in that environment so many times that he knows how to deal with it and, you know, and, and handle it positive. Whereas someone who's the rookie, they're feeling it for the third time. But if you've, you know, experience that experience before you've learned how to deal with it and you're prepared so when you go into the big stage because some guys go into the big stage it's their first game and they're confident as hell aren't they why is that because they've handled the emotions and some somehow it's like having the cheat code or whatever you know what i mean they know mm. how to deal with it so they're better prepared that's all it means but well, some are not prepared and they have to go through it but they still you know whether you're prepared or not you can still go on and become a success yeah i think you being the individual that you are and then your son doing what he's doing i being a son myself sometimes you don't listen to your parents but no, i didn't have a i didn't have a i didn't have a parent that achieved what you've done in a sporting context my family didn't have a sporting background which maybe helped me out individually because it allowed me to sort of forge my own path yeah. so it's in, interesting that You've got someone like yourself who has had the career that you've had and then you have your son that wants to go into a similar field. Yeah. How do you blend being hands-on and allowing him to do what he wants to do and create his authentic journey and be his own man? Absolutely. That's, that's, that, that's the trick, isn't it? And, you know, I have got it wrong in the past because I basically thought to myself, I've done this. Do as I do, you come a bit, you come, you become successful. Then I realized, no, it's not, what's that? Because I tried to become an agent uh, for a period of time. And I, 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 I learned a lot um, from life. And then I, I realized that um, any situation, 
there's positives from it, there's negatives from it. It's like if you are an aspiring boxer um, and you come from the ghetto, it's probably a, a lot easier to succeed than if you were an aspiring boxer and then you won the lottery and got hundreds of million pounds, you know. But then in life, which would you choose? So I said to him, it's probably, you know, it might have been easier for you to achieve and become, uh, you know, a professional sportsman if, you know, you didn't have me, maybe, because then you would it'd be easier for you, you know, you've got to stamp your own authority and blah, blah, blah. But then there's the positives. The positives are you wouldn't have my genes, mate. You might have the genes of an overweight horse player, so you'd have that challenge. And then you would, you know, I'm being dumb at So whatever situation in life, if you understand and realise there's going to be positives on that situation, and negatives, and then we go on this journey together, and some t- things will get right and some things will get wrong, but I know which I'd rather have if I was going to choose, to, you know, because I know that, um, you know, if that's why back in the olden days, what happened? If you're done with a banker, you end up becoming a banker, didn't you? Because there was no colleges or whatever. I'm going back to the 1700s or whatever. If your dad was a blacksmith, it was easy because you grew up with your dad. But if your dad was a sword fighter, then you became a, you know, became a sword fighter because he could teach you from a young age. You know, you saw your dad do whatever that is. He got you to help him. And you, start, you almost had that apprenticeship through your childhood, didn't you? So that's how it works. So it's kind of understanding these things of, of how life was back then. Well, it's interesting that you say that because you mentioned about the whole concept of you are the you are the sum of the five people that you spend your time with. I would also then maybe say, well, you kind of are the sum of the five habits that you most commonly do and you're surrounded with. And for you, you're in shape for your age, right? You jump yeah. in a cold shower in the morning. So how, how, how important do you think it is for you to show good, strong, healthy habits to your young, aspiring sporting child? Absolutely. We all know that uh, being a good example is the best thing you can do rather than just telling people what to do because everyone knows what to do. Everyone knows what to do. Everyone knows what to do to stay healthy, don't they? But then they say most of the world is not healthy. So it's having that motivation to do it. So what provides that motivation? As I said, it's the story. It's what you see, If you're what you're surrounded by. If you see your dad who is been retired 20 odd years, get up in the morning, exercising, staying in shape, walking around with your dad at various um, uh, events and people still coming up who are, who, who are established sportsmen now. You know, I took my son to watch a game and Kevin Simple came up to um, came up to me and said, oh, hi, Martin, how are you doing? And, so, and I said, this is my son, Tyler. And the first thing he says is, your dad's a great player. So that, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, if you um, show, it's more powerful than than if you tell him. If I, you know, now, if I go to Wembley, you'll go, Dad, I know, you scored a try at Wembley in how many years ago, you're dialing off of it for the rest of your life. Look, I don't need to think your statue. You know, it's good to be a dad. It's understanding that you are a parent first. And your source of information second. And now I love it because, um, you know, he comes and tells me stuff now, which the England coach, England backs coach, Will Parkin, has told him about. I tell him this, this is simple math. I should tell him because we have these strategies. I should tell him that. Tyler, if you touch the ball twice, and this is stuff I've told Liam Williams, I've told this to established international players. I said to them, if you only touch the ball two times, you can't score a hat It's impossible. When they just say something simple like that, <laughs> just play something simple. and I say to them, if you touch the ball three times, you still ain't going to score a hat trick. If you touch the ball in the game 20 times, mm, we're in the game now. Mm. So I thought, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just simple things like that. Telling somebody, because we all know that now that life's about data, isn't it? It's all about data. Everything's about data. But it's, every company is about data because if you have data, it takes the guesswork out of everything. You know about it. But I was understanding data and pattern. I didn't know it was data. I used to say things like, imagine that. This is me in the 1980s. They come out of, there's a certain number of tries that will be scored by every team between the sticks and the right hand uh, flag and between the sticks and the left hand flag. And I'm thinking, if I only scored tries down my left wing, I will score a percentage of the tries that scored in that area. Okay? That means I'm limiting 
the number of tries that I can score to that. Now, if I can take a if I can take a chunk out of the scores, the tries scored between the sticks and the left, the sticks and the right, and underneath the sticks, that's a lot more. So I can be good. And I'm thinking, is everyone else thinking like this? I'm thinking, no. So that's why I used to be all over the pitch. So and then, so I um, put some footing together of of where I saw a clip of a commentator talking about me doing that, saying I was here and I was there. And then I put it together with a clip of Chris Ashton saying, Tyler, listen to this man. I learned from him. And I put that together and put it on a little reel. And I thought, and I thought, put that, I thought, man, that's pretty powerful. I'm doing stuff now that people that the World Park and the England coach is telling him to do, which I've been telling him to do, which well, he wasn't getting it so much. But then when I got him to watch videos of Chris Ashton, uh, I got him to see this video of Chris Ashton talking, that I'm doing this in the 80s. And then the England coach, I said, that's powerful. That's powerful motivation. All those things coming together. Then it's just not me. It's just not me talking to my son, telling him. And I, because I always see things of that, it's take responsibility. So I always say to myself, if Tyler is not successful, it's not his fault. It's my fault. So that's that. It's, it's my fault. It's, so you take hundred percent responsibility for things, even if it's so that's the mindset, isn't it? It's not really your fault. But if you, you believe it is your fault, then you're going to do everything. You're going to think of every creative way of what you can do and everything because you're taking responsibility and go on that journey. And now, in the age of two, he now signed a professional. He's, he's a professional sportsman, but it's still not about. There's no end to it. It's not like oh, he's a professional sportsman. We the end with one. No, it's about the journey. Where can we take this? How can we make it? How? What do we do going on that? Be on that because it is about the process, but it's all about it's the result as well. It's like you're becoming the best you can be, and if he's the best he can be. And he's in the right space as I saw the G. Because don't get me wrong, I took my son to football, he was judo as well. You know, he was the third best judoka, what they call it, in the country for his age 10. But I'm always about love the things in life that love you. Judo is a great sport. It taught him a lot of things early. But I thought to myself, how many people have I ever known that have done judo in this country? One, Brian Jacks. Why do I know him? Because those superstars. Hmm. How many rugby players do I know? Uh, <laughs> so love things that love you, you know. Now he, he got a scholarship to two public schools. Uh, he has got a free ride at, um, you know, he's going to do a degree as well and then become a job. So love things in life that love you and also know your niche, know what you can do. I am I. If he was six foot ten, he'd be playing basketball. <laughs> Or when I see people in the street, they're six foot ten. I bet everyone comes up and says, "You do basketball." So everyone is pointing you. You know, if you're really fast, everyone in your school go, well, "You tried athletics." But sometimes, for some people who, you know, uh, who get inside them, it's hard because not the whole world in life is not directed them towards what it be. So, mm. as a parent, I take one hundred percent responsibility whether it's my fault or not, that will make me do whatever I can. If I have to stay up all night, if I have to get in a cold shower, I do it mentally. I'm saying to myself, I'm doing that for them. Like I remember once when I was in this I was in the sauna and I and I was uh and I was saying to my son that I think we was having something, some argument or whatever, who's gonna stay in the in the sauna longer? And I just played the mental trick like Michael Jordan does. I said, if I don't stay in this sauna longer than him, he will not become a professional sportsman so he's never gonna stay there longer than me because i you'll do for others more than you'll do he's doing it just uh i said if you stay in it longer than me you'll get 20 quid and i just said there's no way that he's gonna stay in that sauna longer than me because i love him so much that i'm literally kill myself to stay because i'm playing mental tricks with myself and i said that's when it is when you're doing for somebody else and why wouldn't you want somebody who loves you that much and is prepared to sacrifice everything to help you if that means staying away from you or do you want people in your corner rather than than um uh, you know don't get me wrong if you can do it yourself then yeah it might be better but i'm i can't help it you are my son that's it that's the you know they say play the card you're dealt and then what am i going to do beat myself in the head and kill myself so he's on his own to, to, to forge your career himself and to be like you you know what i mean 
not have to, I'd just take myself. There's lots of people, you know, I could have been a, a you know, absent father, you know, when, when I, my wife was pregnant for, with, uh, with Tyler, we worked together, but then I, I made a conscious decision that no, this is my journey. I'm going to do that. We got together, we did this and we went on that journey. So as I say, there are more than one way to get a cat in it. You play the cards you're dealt and you go on that journey. And I say, it's not about being successful. It's about going on the journey and yeah. seeing if you can become successful. And that is the joy. And it's like, imagine that if you, you support Man United and you know, if someone told you Man United are going to win every single game and then we will not lose a game until you die. Is that going to be much joy supporting Man United? Then we've got after one and two, but you know, even when I was a Man United supporter, before, you know, I, I enjoy watching Man United as much now because people don't call me a glory hunter and we're going through trials and tribulations. So sometimes if you know it's all gravy, then that's why maybe once people win the lottery, they have negative things happen to them because it's about going on that journey, earning everything that you that you get and going on that journey. And uh, so, so and if you're dealt the cards of you, you have a special um, in run with the dad. I said, you're playing in the, I played in the premiership in your position. How could that not be a nice day? I think, <laughs> I, th I think it's really, I think it's really interesting that what you said about you take responsibility for your child. Many parents, and I get this from schools, if I'm going and speaking in a school, if I go into definitely sports teams, you ask them like, what's one of the biggest challenges right now? And they will, unanimously come back and say it's parents and it's interesting because the parents are coming to them through them wanting to control the situation they they're so unsure about the future of what their child's going through but they're trying to control the outcome but you you know you can't control the outcome everything you've spoken about is about process you talking about the percentages of being on the field grab getting the ball as many times as you possibly can 20 plus times that's a process. That's something that you know, if I do this process, it could lead to good outcomes. However, many people, and especially the parents that haven't been down professional sporting routes, they know, or they, sorry, they don't know that if you just allow the process to happen, then eventually the outcome will, will come. But they try to control that process. Why didn't you pick my child? Like, my child needs to be playing in this team. My ch child should be doing this. They they scored this many tries this day and you've not picked, select them you've gone over this kid here and you've chosen them over them. But what I love that you're talking about is sort of stepping back and going, okay, well, if I put myself into a good place, if I put, if I do these habits, these routines, these processes that I believe are good for my child, then through what's called a vicarious experience, which is one of the strong, one of the, a, a strong connector of building self-belief in a, in a person that they get to, they get to just watch that habit and hopefully feel motivated to want to to chase it. Most people, it's really interesting, will chase a vicarious experience through someone that they want to be like, like a role model, someone that they they may perhaps don't know. So you think about maybe your own journey. I think about my journey. There were athletes that ignited motivation in me to want to get started in in sport. I wanted to be like someone. I wanted to. I saw someone do something and was like, oh, I want to go down that journey. But it's interesting for your son because he's going to be having that experience with his father. But you could have chosen to sit on the sofa and regale stories about, oh, I did this, I did that. But you're not. You're showing him the path. Like these are strong habits that you can you can take on. And I think setting those examples is just far more powerful than words or trying to control the situation by going to a coach, asking him to do it and going, no. I'm going to focus on improving my child through how I'm behaving, what I know is right, and I think that's it. And and how how much of what you do do you set? You 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 mentioned about getting into going to cold showers, uh, if, if almost like a punishment. But how much of setting rules and boundaries do you have as and, and think of that as being something that's valuable? Because I see many parents sort of taking away those rules and going well we live in a world that's that's very much talking about well-being but it talks about creating safe spaces but i also believe that there's a safety in setting rules setting boundaries creating creating those those markers for failure 
so how how important do you see those in in building a stronger mindset? I like to see myself as a beacon that lights the path, and you know I use my own story, uh, the good things, the bad things, you know what my parents did, the good, the bad, uh, everything, what I'm learning today, and what I see from success because I've got. You know, I've seen other people, other teammates have had sons. Some have been successful, some have not been successful. And but you've got, you know, and I believe as a, so the same way that I believed in myself as an athlete. And you know, they say in life, um, you know, seeing is believing. No, I say it the other way around. Believing is seeing. Yeah, you have to believe first. Then once you believe, then you see it. Because once you believe, then you see you see the future. And and again, it is, I always say that, that perception is reality. If you believe you're a great parent, you're going to do all the, the best you can do for your kid. Um, then, you know, I've seen the future anyway. I've seen how this 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 pans out. I've seen it. And I just have, we just have to, to um, go through the process. And I'll say it's all about your perception. I remember this time last year, like Tyler's getting all these accolades this time. I'm saying, remember this time last year, yeah, when everyone was, all the other good boys in your year were, were advancing, they were playing for England, you weren't getting picked. I remember what I said to you then, I said how powerful it is telling somebody who is good enough that they're not good enough is the greatest blessing in the world. It's the great, because what they do, they become even better. <laughs> and mm. that, I said, and that's, I don't want to get too political, but I say that was the plight of many black sportsmen back in the day who weren't, you know, who didn't get to go on the pitch because they said they weren't good enough. What did they do? They went and got better and better. Though so they were so good, your it was it wasn't it was undeniable. Your presence in the team was undeniable. And if that's how good you've got to be, then that's a blessing. And I should say, that's a that's a mindset if isn't it? Rather than going to the coach and saying, My son is good enough. He should be playing. Yeah? And then getting the arm when he's not playing, but Bob just let me just say, God, thank you, Steve, not saying thank you. Because I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go and work even harder. Because if you work harder and harder and harder, eventually it becomes undeniable. You will find a way in. Because if you keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and sometimes that's a hard thing to do when you're, you know, it's hard, isn't it? When you're constantly getting pushed back, you're constantly getting rejected, you're constantly to, to keep. What's your other, what's your alternative? The third in life, you either see you die and give up. So once you know those things and keep pushing, eventually you get you get where you you're meant to get to. And I think that's what it is. And some and so it's someone you don't have to want engineer the adversity because it's there for you. It's like they're helping you. You don't have to engineer adversity. You're not getting picked. You're not getting something which you which thing you deserve. So if you didn't deserve it, then then that's not helping you, you know what I mean? Because it's the pride. But if you actually think you know, a bit, then that's where the, the beauty comes on. The beauty in, in the process comes. I'd be interested to know through your journey and the adversities you faced, and you face adversity with a smile. And I've seen you talk about facing these adversities and taking on these challenges with a smile, being thankful for them. And I found this quote by Seneca, which was really sung to this and it was no man is more unhappy than he who never faces adversity for he is not permitted to prove himself so i'm curious to know whether through your adversities and smiling th through them were you using your adversities to prove other people wrong or were you using them to prove yourself right well i don't think i was trying to prove other people Wrong. That wasn't my motivation, really, or even to prove myself right. I just wanted to win. Just in life, I just wanted to win. And what does winning look like for you? It just becomes being successful, doing what I set out to do. Um, I was the youngest of three children. I was literally the runt of the litter. Um, I was the the child that everyone used to uh, congregate in rooms. And say what we're going to do with Martin. That was me. Um, so 
maybe subconsciously, subconsciously, I was trying to prove people wrong, but I, I didn't see it as that. You know, I'd always say, your, your perception is your reality. How you see things at the time, how you shake things, and it's your truth. Because I see some people, and they get caught up on the reality of the, the truth. You know, when I say the truth, the truth that everyone else sees. You know, it's not doesn't matter what everyone else sees. It only matters what you see. That's why I say perception is your reality. Isn't it? Everyone in the world can think you're rubbish, but then you can think that you're amazing and you go do amazing things. Francis Ngannou for Titan Fury. No one thought he was going to do that. Only Pop Francis Ngannou. See? So, and now everyone jumps on board. And, uh, you know what I mean? And then they become great. And that's why, that's, that's life right there. That's creating something, isn't it? That, but if Francis Ngannou believe what the world is, Thing, then we'd have nothing. So when that's when you're that's when you've got an opportunity. So you should um you should relish those situations. That's when you go into a final. I know that the games that I won when no one gave us a hell chance are the games now that I remember fondly. You know, ninety four in um in Brisbane when Wigan beat the Brisbane Broncos, who were the greatest rugby league team probably ever that 90th Brisbane team with all the players that they had. And we went over there and we beat them. I remember in 88, when I played against Australia at the Sydney Football Stadium, and I think Great Britain beating Australia in Australia for 15, 20 years or something. And we won those games. I remember waking up uh, the morning of the 92 Challenge Cup final. And there was a story about me in the Daily Mirror. Imagine that. Even to this day, if you... A rugby player, you have a whole um, newspaper page written about you. Even today, in 2024, you're a rugby player. That's something amazing. So for me, as a rugby player, in 1994, to have a whole page, and it's on my Instagram, you can go and see it's pinned, the first story on my Instagram page. Uh, and a guy called Alex Murphy wrote a story saying that I was finished. I was the best of a bad bunch because I've had a shoulder dislocation or I've been through some trials and tribulations. And I just thought to myself, wow, this is set up for me. Imagine that. I'm live on B. How many times is that going to be set up like that? I'm live on BBC in front of 80,000 people and there's a story written about me. In And I, and I knew and I believed myself because I'd been through a lot. And all those that helped me and I was coming good. And I thought, man, this is space. Imagine that. We're live on BBC. And this is where there's only a couple of channels. So a lot of people are watching this. And I, I remember walking around the stadium that day. And, and the, I think people were trying to interview me because of the, of the, the story that came out. And I was thinking that, no, I don't want to be interviewed before the game. That's not going to be remembered. But I said, I want, to be re- I want to be interviewed after the game. If I can be interviewed after the game, I know I've done something. And I thought, that's winning. You know what I mean? And, and then I managed to score the try that I remember, going to be remembered for forever. There's a statue outside Wembley. There's a bar, bar named in the Wembley Stadium after that. People don't know anything about rugby. We just go, who are friends of mine who have met me once, will go and go, oh, that the five I bet. I've transcended time because of that moment, right? It's going to go into the, that's actually still going to be there after I've gone from that moment, walking out on that pitch. And so what's when when I did it, I went to my knees and I thought, wow, you know what I mean? And uh, ironically, when uh, the guy who wrote the story, Alex Murphy, uh, is on that statue with me because he was a great player. But a great player and wrote a negative story about me in the Daily Mirror. The Daily Mirror decided to print the whole of that story. It was the whole page, no other story. Mark Five finished and I'd gone and I'd created something which is a moment of magic. And forever, that's my motivation. When I get up in the morning, I'm thinking, God, imagine if my son could have a moment half as good as that. I would do anything to help him create that, whether that's being an overbearing dad, whether that's being a bad, that, that stays back, whether that's being a dad that engineers adversity, whether that's a dad that gets to understand my children and know the motivation, know that they like playing on space station, know that they like money, don't give them those two things unless they earn it, try and help them control the process, step back. This is the thing that my um, son doesn't know, and I hope he never sees this podcast because then I'm letting a cat about trying to share things. I make friends with his friends and try and get them involved as well. So I know that he's got positive role models around them. 
Uh, I put funny things out. I try to help them by giving them information because then they'll go, they're more impressed that I'm his dad than he's impressed that I'm his dad. Does that make sense? Because yeah. their dad's going, oh, you're best friends with Martin Fire's son or something like that. Just, I, I'm so into it mentally that sometimes I trip myself up. You know what I mean? That's how bad I want it. <laughs> but, see, because I think I'm doing something good. And then I remember um, um, Chris has to say to me, do you think you're too much sometimes? I say, yes, yes, no. But then again, you know what I mean? Who would I want in my camp? If I was a baker and my dad was Gordon, you know, was a cook and I'm my, would I want Gordon Ramsay to be my dad? Um, yeah. If I wanted to be a writer and one of the greatest writers of all time or no. was my, but what would I want? Given the choice, what would I want? Well, I said, yes, I would choose me. So then be me, be the best me that you can be. Yes, make mistakes. Yes, um, make some, um, make some good decisions. And then being created to the joy, the same way that I enjoyed my career. And you know what I mean? I enjoyed the things, all the things that I achieved. And then when I did this, I can remember when I got my first nice car, when I got my first contract, when I bought my first house, which had a swimming pool in it. When I did, uh, you know, the first time that someone, I mean, when I signed my first autograph, when I did all these little miles, I just, I just rejoiced all those things. So now when my son does things, you know what I mean? I, I rejoice in them and I enjoy that life. I think what's life about? Life to me is about love, helping people, seeing how much you can squeeze the juice out of this orange. You know, you can enjoy all those emotions, the good emotions, the heartbreak. You know what I mean? Love them. You know, like, you know, the first time my heart was broken, you know, learning how to love, learning how to enjoy things, you know, learning how to not work as hard, learning how to work harder. Just learning, enjoying, growing, developing, however you want to, you know, uh, I don't know, package it up, getting the most out of it. So you so you think, you know, after you watch the movie, you walk out of the movie, you think, oh, that was a great movie. You know what I mean? So when we walk out of this thing called life, go, oh, that was a great life. Mm. And I can't put it into any more terms of that. And that is just understanding your story, knowing and giving, isn't it? Yeah, how many, uh, leading on from that learning thread is you obviously know andy farrell uh yeah. and uh, and he's just been sort of as of we're in january right now he's just been named as the lions lions head coach and there's good documentation of this the journey that owen's been going on in the sort of i would say pre pre-world cup and uh, and sort of the social media backlash that he's he's faced what have you learned from people like Andy who have again got a son that's gone into the same sport but whether that's through professionally you've learned from him but also the way he's handling the whole situation of being a, a leader in the sport as well as having an extremely blessed and and, and talented son in in the game um I spent uh, you know obviously a lot of time with Andy over the years and we were together recently in um in Dubai, when we were both, um, I like to tell people he was my assistant because I was uh, been coaching the team longer than he was, and he came out um, uh, to Dubai and say uh, in uh, in December, and we were talking, and I wanted um, Owen to go back to Wigan and play um, for Wigan for a little bit, but uh, <laughs> he he dropped the hit that you know he was more likely to end up in uh, in France. Um, but, you know, you've seen over the years that Andy has allowed Owen to be his own man. He's been there. He's been a confidant. He's been a sounding board. He's been, um, um, you know, that advice, uh, that rock. Um, but Owen's his own man and he, he, he's done his own thing. You know what I mean? He, he chooses not to speak to the media. He does whatever he wants to do. But it's allowing someone to be their own person, to make their own decisions, not make their decisions for them. You know, you always want to be um, there for your, your kids, you know, but you can always, that you can always see that he, he, there is that hierarchy. He is, one is the father, one is the son. There's a little clip, I think, on Instagram, which I um, uh, put a few laughing emojis under and 
Colleen uh, Owen's mum, who I also have a good relationship with, uh, and like like my uh, my comment because it, it, it was just uh, Andy uh, taking all the hands of uh, all the players after a Lions game, and then he came to Owen, and he gave him a clip round the ear. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> to me that just that little that little thing just. So much, you know, I think really people that. love that. I think people would love it. Not, not, I think people would find it in a situation like that. Someone would have found it weird if he shook his hand. It's, yeah. it's, you you want to see the you want to see the human being yes. side of it. We connect with that. We connect with yeah. the human being side of it. So yeah, something like that is just what we want to see. Yeah, and, I, and I've been and I've been in awe of Andy and Owen and how that relationship has has developed. And, you know, as I said, I used to send Owen videos, sorry, I used to send Andy videos of Tyler when he was eight years old scoring and stuff like that, just to get, and Sean, just to get their take. And, you know, and I remember uh, Sean came and coached uh, Tyler, just on my green, just out here when he was eight or nine years old, just to have that relationship and to, to, to get that um, understanding and just to, to learn, to and to learn not only from knowledge, but, uh, to learn emotionally, you know, uh, to, to, to develop and understand those things. And, yeah, it's, it's been great. And, and that's why I say I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to to have those relationships, to be able to learn from those relationships. Um, I was recently on a Zoom with Tyler and uh, George Ford and uh, to, to, to understand him and to understand, you know, what did he learn from his uh, father, you know, which helped him to, to understand, and and the bit I was I was getting from from everyone was that yes, you can't. It's not just a case of you do as I do, you know, and or do as I say. It's about just being that example, being that, that source of information, understanding that even if you give them the right information, they are not going to necessarily take it. To be okay with that, which is a hard thing for mm. most people, you know, coaches wouldn't be okay with that. You know, you wouldn't be okay if you was a coach giving a player the right information and being okay that they don't take that on board. That's a weird situation. And how do you learn that? How do you learn that? And to, to know that it's in there and he will probably use it after he has probably failed and might come back to it or after someone else who he probably connects with on a different level gives him that information and then he'll piece it together and understand that and then he'll come back and then he'll probably tell you about it and then you'll have to go, you know, I didn't tell you that five years ago and being okay with that. So it's understanding that and going through that process, that's emotional growth, isn't it? Learn how to grow emotionally and understand that, you know, it's not about like that, it's about like that with because your own journey is then trying to understand things that your parents taught taught you which you probably didn't you know that advice and sometimes it's hard to go back and just to think okay i remember that i remember did i do that and how i learned things like that and you know where just just yeah there's a lot in there you have to unpick a lot it would have been it would have been fascinating to know perhaps conversations that would happen between andy and uh, and owen between the moment of him getting quite a lot of online abuse, whether it was through tackles, whether it was during the World Cup, whatever it might be. Even now, even he stepped away from the game for a bit and 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 then going back into it. But it would have been interesting to know what those sorts of conversations were, would have been. And and I've spoken many times on this this podcast around getting the right type of support and understanding what your support, the type of support you need. I've spoken to many psychologists around that support that you need I, I think one thing i found fascinating that you've done there is talking to your son's friends and uh, and using them as sort of people to to help boost and create the environment that you that you think would be friendly whether you, whether someone might interpret that as some form of control i don't know but you would also say like well actually it's it's why not try and make sure that the environment that your child is in is a positive one because you're not going to be there every time you're not going to be there all the time and you're not going to be there for every step of the way and i think it's a great move to be able to say right okay well i want the environment my child is in to be a, a positive one i want good role models around them i want good figures i want them to also perhaps be able to support messages 
that are going to only help them because you know that that's the right thing. No, and it's not from that standpoint. It's more from a standpoint because I want to help them as well. There are totally, yeah, great they're, point. They're, you know, when I when I give you a point, this must have been what two thousand twelve or whatever it was. I think, um, maybe even earlier when I started. I I've got a green there. I got I got some balls. Got some cones. And I was started working with Tyler. So then I said to, well, you know, if any of your friends want to come down, you know, that, that's okay. So within a couple of weeks, you know, all his friends come down. But, but that's, you know, I'm getting, mate, I don't think I'm paying £30 for this coaching. I'm getting free coaching. But I went and did a coaching course, you know. I used to call myself the most overqualified level two coach. Yes. <laughs> uh, I was coaching seven-year-old kid. It's in the basement. Well, then I'm going to do it from... Why, why would I do it? And then I think through, uh, Martin Bethlehem and another guy called George Simpson, who's I don't know, three of the, my alumni, as I call him, all end up in academies. And I was just thinking, my joy from it was that one day, if I could sit down, watch, this is my mindset, one day, if I could sit down watching telly, and I was watching, like, I thought to myself, this is the joy that, you know, grassroots coaches get, that one day you could sit down, watch TV, and they're the kid that you coached when you were, when he was seven, playing in a freaking game. I thought, how wonderful must that be? And just to say, I had a part of the journey, I'm thinking there might have been some people who must have said that about me. Mm. But I get funny things now, even funny, uh, uh, that's the thing I love about social media, I get funny messages from people. And it's a guy called Dave Osborne, who was a much better player than me when I started at uh, Rosling Park. And he always liked to send me little messages to remind me of that fact. And I'm thinking, he must die now, and man. He must enjoy that for us to do <laughs> His existence, they were born. I think he played at was it there? He played for Kent, I think, and he played um obviously played for Roslyn Park when I was at Roslyn Park. And it always reminds me, and I know that even people that I went to school with, because I wasn't the greatest rugby player in my school, they love to remind me that they were better than me. And I'm thinking that's their joy, that's their thing that they could have. And I'm and I'm all for spreading the love if I can spread the love. So I'm thinking that if I can help some other people, and I'll the joy is when I can see them sing, seeing them other people see is their joy and if they're around my kids then they're going to be practicing and they're, they're going to be more likely to say Tyler let's go and practice as well so if you know what they say what goes around comes around it and, and there's uh, also a there, there's also a, a network effect that's happening there so if you're creating good environments with your friendships with the people that you surround yourself with by default you are creating this invisible viral effect that they're spreading positivity to the next five people that they meet. Hopefully it, inf it infects someone in that five that then spreads out and then you've just got this compound effect. And nothing beats that through strong friendship groups that whether you are all going and striving to achieve your goals, creating good, strong habits. And I I'm a big believer in that with young athletes that I coach is just check your mates at the door almost and make sure that are they are they fanning your flames or are they pissing all over them and <laughs> like essentially I had this one athlete who he was it, his one escape and this is COVID creating this issue was that he would go on to his his video games and they would all jump on the headsets and all his mates are everywhere and they're video gaming till really late at night or sometimes even till like 2 a.m in the morning right and he then goes to training the next day and he's slightly off it he has a bad training session and he's going in the gym he's nailing himself in the gym and he's exhausted and and then he comes to me and says well i'm just this is really hard this is really challenging i go well okay are you doing this diet yet yeah, cool training yet yeah, cool what what else is, are you doing? He's like, well, I'm up playing video games with my mates, but it's when I connect with my mates. And I said, well, this is where they are your friends, but you're going to have to check them at the door a little bit to go, right, lads, I'm tapping out at 10 o'clock. This is me because my goal is to go over here. Now, it might not be your goal, but this is mine. And not everyone is going to have a group of friends that are all got great habits and got great behaviors that will support them. But if you don't have them, it's really important that you set your standard and you go, this is uncompromising. This is not what I wish to to compromise on. And, and this is where I'm going. And I think 
it's hard for young people because you want to be your your one job in life sort of as a adolescent is to fit in and that's very hard to do but if you can do it you can be mentally strong enough to do that i think you'll you'll just rise above and that opportunity becomes greater and i and i think as a whole of this podcast with the lack of perceived resilience that you have in the world right now i believe that there is the bar has never been lower therefore that sets an amazing opportunity for you to just get your head above the parapet and excel and be seen as different and be seen as someone that can have great outcomes and has great character as well i think uh there is positives and negatives in that you know the level of competition is a lot harder now because everyone knows about mindset everyone knows about all these things um we are in literally a world economy so you're competing against kids all over the world uh especially in like some sports like football and other things so everyone you know you're competing against kids who you weren't competing against uh you know 20 30 years ago the market was a lot smaller so yeah as i say you have to look for different 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 difference makers uh, my son my younger son has a problem with um you know playing on video games now he wants to be a gaddy master you know yeah. so, <laughs> you know but i never poo poo other people's um you know ideas even if they're my kids because i i know that they probably know or think they know more than i do in the same way that you know my parents are education 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 they were saying it because of what they know so you have to know that okay i thought i knew more than my parents so why don't my kids think they know more than me or they know the world more more than me because we are in this instagram social media you know in a different world than the world that we grew up in uh as, as a child so it's kind of understanding that as well and being sensitive to that but then understanding and knowing that the principles of success don't change and they are if you are doing what everyone else is doing chances are you're going to get what everyone else is, everyone else gets so if you want to be different you've got to be different <laughs> yeah and being great is being different so yeah. what do you want and don't give up what you want for what you want right now you know what I mean? yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very conscious of time, Martin. We've your. Uh, if there's one thing I wish I, I could do is bottle your energy. <laughs> I wish if there's one thing I could do is bottle your energy for this uh, this this podcast. But I want to sort of just there's one thing that's come out of the theme of your story is your you spoke about your your father's book and understanding your emotions and that requires a level of uh, emotional intelligence. But one thing you've been quite good post career was uh, financially. You you looked after yourself during your career and. That transition out of sport for you, it's a big conversation now. And rugby, in in it, as just a as a siloed sport, has got many issues in certain areas of it in the in the union world. And there's been lots of players that would have been very quickly transitioned out of the game in the last 12, 12 months with a lot of the 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 financial issues in in the game. Yeah. Where do you stand with what 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 has helped you in your transitioning out of the sport? I know pre recording we've spoken about your your twenty you're now longer retired than you were playing the sport. And I'm seven, eight years retired out of my sport. So I'm curious to know sort of what that experience has been for you and perhaps lessons you've learned along the way. The one thing that I um knew when I was playing was that one day this would be all over and i saw my playing career as like writing a book or creating a piece of art and once you finish that painting once you uh finish the last chapter in that book and write the end it's done yeah and then you can't go back and write that book you can't go back and create that piece of art again so knowing that you're going to put as much juice into that, create the best piece of art that will stand the test of time. And that's what I was doing. Like every time I went out on that pitch, I knew I was communicating with everyone watching, whether that was on the TV, whether that was in the stand, I was communicating with them, whether that was because they were, you know, racially abusing me, whether they were cheering me. I played for witness. 
and witness sorry i played for witness that wigan fans used to hate and abuse me i played for wigan and witness fans that's when i found stupid thing well i found that I just, that didn't make sense to me i thought you know if i play for you then i'm okay if i don't play for you i'm not okay and i you know and that was a hard thing to get my head around but i gave it my all and i knew that i was creating works of art that the tries that i scored would stand the test of time i know that when i'm dead that someone who's never heard of me who never seen me play didn't even know i exist will come across some footage on me on social media and go wow and might make them like google me and find out and think about about me or somebody is going to walk past my statue at wembley see my name and go because i do that when i <laughs> walk past statues because i maybe it's because i haven't got statues i became interested in them so when I, when I go past one i always think to myself what has something done to be able to i was you know i don't know what what you know i walk around i think it was around um COVID time me and my wife before our valentines walked around london uh with the, some cans of some drink and then we're looking at statues and just you know and then googling and finding them out about these interesting people and the lives that they led, led and what they must have done and i think somebody's going to be doing that about me and that's and the, all that all stem to me playing on the pitch and you know and people you know, they might not have been into rugby and even when now people go to me you know i'm not a really rugby fan but i remember watching your game and i remember you doing that thing when you scored that length of field try and i think that's that mainly it was a success and then i went on from that to appear on like most of reality tv shows so i was just creating a, i didn't know about creating a brand and doing all these things and so i was just communicating with people just trying to be positive and and you know just give them something and, and make them love me and you know and get caught up in that whole experience and create positive emotions now i'm an ambassador the wigan club you know and all the things that i've achieved you know and then now my nephew adele of fire who is a professional footballer at brighton you know my son uh my my, my other son you know they're all going to be building their legacy on top of what i have built and I just didn't, that warms the cockles of my heart. As I said, that all comes down to the fact that I knew that my career was a work of art and I'm just going to be the best rugby player that I can be. And that led to me being on Strictly Come Dancing. That led to me being on Hunted. That led me to being on a wealth of reality TV shows, which again have recycled the name of the fire for the last 20 years. And you created something, not the biggest thing in the world, but you created something. And, you know, and I said to Tyler, that's what you're doing. You're building on something. You know, so that is something good. So when people, you know, even now when he's playing on games and they're they're, they're being streamed on YouTube on, on a platform called Next Gen, um, which is you know a, a platform which screens you know uh, kids schoolboy rugby games, and they're always going to say, even the commentator is always going to say, when Tyler scores a try, they'll say little things like, uh, "What a great finish from Tyler of Fire." Who knows where he got that from with a wry smile? You know, I like this smile. And uh, my uh, nephew makes his debut in the Premiership. And they uh, they say, oh, Adele of Fire, nephew, you know, and that makes a smile. And because of what I've done, I think to myself, and that makes me smile for my dad, you know what I mean, who wrote that book. And I believe in still things in myself um, and my brother. And my brother's story is a whole different story, which we haven't got time to get into in this podcast. But it's just life, isn't it? It's just life. It's just like, you know, I'd like to put it back to you and say, you know, what you get most out of life. And it is life itself, isn't it? Ups to downs, the successes that, you know, randomly, you know, you're watching TV and I see myself come up with a question from the chase or some other random show. I just think, yeah, man, you've done something. You know, that actually, what you've done has got meaning. People have got something out of it. You've affected other people's lives in a positive way. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's it. You know, uh, that's, I think to me, that's a success. It's not the winning, the losing, the earning money, the things that you think are success or failure at that time are not. It's just not, it's, it's legacy, isn't it? It's what you leave for other people. I think you have said there that you essentially accepted that it was a chapter. And I think that's one of the hardest things for young people to want to accept that it's going to be a chapter. And my, my family were pretty good and diligent and i think with given my condition and the fact that i knew 
being in the sport in general was a challenge and I knew it would come to an end. I was sort of met with that reality that there is going to be an end to this. But it is, you do get drawn into the fact that when you're in it, you're like, this may never end. <laughs> you kind of, yeah, you yeah. can easily get sucked into going, well, this could go on forever. And uh, there's even now in many sports, like sports science, I mean, we've had Mike Brown on the podcast and like Mike is 39 and he's still going and he's just signed another contract. It doesn't even look yeah. like he's slowing down. So sports science is creating longevity and that I've even spoken to him about transitioning and, and, and his his fears around that. But I think that whole, when you are able to go into an environment that we've been in, in the professional sport environment, you can't take for granted of what it creates in you as a person. I think I did take it for granted to begin with, but then I realized, wow, there's so much that I can take from that journey. Whether people remember you for what you've done, what you've created, what you've achieved, it's now really about the lessons that you've learned, the character that you've built, how you can instill that in other people. And and now for me, it's it's quite simply, I've recently moved to play, I've moved to, to Hove here in the South. And for me, like just some simple bits of life is just being able to walk down the street, down to the seafront and potentially bump into someone that I don't know, but just have that interaction with someone in a positive way. And that is just a idiosyncratic beauty of life. And and I think that's, that's something that I, I now massively value. And I didn't have that where I was previously. And and then if you do get in a conversation and you unravel your story and you understand yeah. their story and yours and lessons you've learned and what you can tell and you're just completely educating and teaching each other it's uh it's wonderful Martin, and the one the one it, story that i have i have i have learned and i like to finish on is that just because you've been successful at that game doesn't mean you're going to be successful after that's what you have to mm -hmm. understand as well is that because of the, the lot of sports you think just because I'm, i became famous and i did this and i've earned all this money i've done that no just because you know, it's like a game and just because you win this game you know you, or you've won the, the championship this season doesn't mean you're going to win the championship next season so that's another thing that sportsmen have to understand just because you become successful at that and just because you failed at this doesn't mean you're going to not succeed at the other one that's just as you said it's just a chapter so you know bank it learn from it and then the games trust it often the game starts again once you retire yeah Two final things I always ask people at the end of the shows is what is something that you're currently perhaps reading, watching, listening to that's inspiring you at the moment? Um, uh, there's two things I say. One is uh, I would say was two books that have inspired me. I love reading um, sportsmen's autobiographies. One is Gary Neville, I think it was Red. And the other one which I'm currently reading now is Dan Carter's uh the art of winning which i'm nearly at the end of now because i love getting other sportsmen you know because i said there is more than one way to skin a cat and just because you've been successful doing it your way you know there's lots of different ways to, to do it but there's but then there's lots of threads that weave in and out common sure. threads that weave in and out of everyone and it's those things that when you have a handle on which um are gold dust and you know because and i'm doing that to help other people as well to help my son and that's how i learn as well and some of that um so i would say to my uh, my nephew adele is that gary neville you know he was one of these people that got rid of all of his friends and he just got everything from hard work and you know i think it was uh, i can't remember his name was the footballer so that no one grows up so i want to be gary neville oh, <laughs> was it the, the liverpool footballer uh but so, jamie, jamie Carrigan, Carrigan. yeah yeah I met Jamie, Jamie Carragher in I think it's up randomly, and, yeah. and I always wanted to meet Jamie Carragher just to, to tell him I read Gary Neville's book, and and I, and, uh, and I remember what you you said, and I and I say most people in the world are Gary Neville, so you should want to, to to grow up to be Gary Neville because to get somewhere through hard work is what the greatest thing, I mean the greatest thing of all really because you don't want to get somewhere just because. You're six foot ten or just because you've got speed because people think oh my five is called no try to speed no you you yeah. become successful because of that because of that and that's what every sportsman should know it's that it's the mental mindset aspect of it yes you might have all the assets you know if you've got speed for having a hammer or a you know a chisel or whatever it's just a school yes and that's what they love things that love you yeah, don't try and become an international sprinter if you haven't got speed. Don't try 
become a basketball player if you're only three foot tall. You know what I mean? Find something which, you know, your niche, you'll find your lane and then work hard. And that's what Gary Neville did. You know what I mean? He just worked hard. I just loved his story about, you know, that he was just, he just outworked everybody. You know, literally, if someone's going to do something, he's going to do more because you can always do more. So if you're in an environment where everyone's here, that's great because all you know, you've got to do there. You know what I mean? And, and that's why I, I love reading people's stories and understanding and learning more and sharing that with other people. Yeah, this podcast has been a journey of that, of understanding those common threads that sit there, but also the things that sit outside of it that can be changed and can be different. And that's fascinating. And you do, I, I love listening to uh, and reading other people's stories because you just, you find them, you just see that where they are. And the, the final question that I always have is from this conversation we've had, if you were to set a challenge to the listeners to take on, what would that challenge be? I would say it doesn't have to be a cold shower. Uh, it doesn't have to be going for a run, but find something that challenges you and try and do it at whatever level you feel comfortable consistently and you'll be a better person. Hmm. I love that. I think a lot of what I've, I've heard from you today is really about setting an example, really setting an example again, whether it's you as a father, whether it's a friend, whether it's someone else, I think that that has been something and, and being able to set an example, not through your words, but through your actions. And people will believe that that's the pure receipts that you have for for the actions that you've done and, and the Absolutely. outcomes that you've got. If I tell all my if I tell my uh, friends now, oh, my son's become a rugby player. He's a professional rugby player now. They'll, go, they'll say, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, well done, Tyler, whatever. Well, because they've seen the journey from he was two. Was it, uh, there, there was a, a documentary on about this American guy. Uh, they called uh, the Robo. TV, try and find out this documentary. It was about the first guy. He was the Los Angeles Raiders, the Los Angeles Raiders uh, strength and conditioner. I think he brought strength and conditioner into the NFL. And he had a son who he sharply videoed his um, um, growth from the, the, the cre- from the cradle. He was doing stretching with him in the cradle. And he, he grew up and he tried his whole way and he got to the NFL, but then he um, only lasted two years. And I remember this is something that really stuck on me early on, which I watched in my childhood, my sort of my child's sort of rugby career. I thought I don't want him to be the Robo QB. So you got to, you know, because he didn't let his son, you know, eat chips. He didn't let him play with his friends. He didn't. He just did everything that you should do, you know, to be successful. He did it. He was successful, and then he flunked out. And they called it the Robo QB. It was called. I remember learning a lot from that, thinking, oh God, yeah, you've got to let your 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 kids eat, you know, a bit of junk food. Then they've got to have a be fun. They've got to go to parties with the kids. Not too many, obviously, because mm-hmm. it's like eighty twenty rule. You only have to be eighty percent good. Don't be a hundred. Don't try and be perfect. No one's perfect. Eight and I remember, I learned a lot from that. So yeah, yeah. After, look that, at that. I'm gonna look at that. That sounds that sounds that, interesting. That, yeah, for anyone with kids who are trying to make them successful, I'd say watch that documentary about the Robo. They called it the Robo QB. Yeah, the Robo. Yeah, Wolfman. sounds like the I mean, yeah, like, like on, we've uh, come out of what's come out of today is just there's no one way to do it there yeah. is no one way and that, your way yeah. there is no the way so no. look, martin thank you so much for for your time it's been a pleasure again i'd want to bottle your energy up and use it as a, <laughs> i feel like if i could sell it then i'd, I'd be a millionaire so i know because i feel it now i feel it I, i'm juiced up now i've got to go out for a walk or do something it's going to be one hell of a walk you're going to move at a hell of a pace <laughs> that's for sure um if people want to get in touch find out more about you where's the best place to direct them just go hell for leather here yeah yeah i'm i'm on all social platforms that's why the to find martin fire is not hard i'm on instagram linkedin and uh, facebook anywhere any platform you'll find me connect with me and you know people do yeah all right i'll leave all the links in the show notes for this episode martin thank you once again it's been a pleasure having you on pleasure thanks